Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle, and in this video, I have for you a Jane Austen inspired library haul. It's true. I went just a little bit crazy on my library website looking for nonfiction related to Jane Austen and her time and um, retellings and adaptations and all of that. So, let's just dive right into this and this is the perfect time to show you during Jane Austen July right so I'm gonna start with the nonfiction books that I found and then I will move into the retellings adaptations etc so first up we have tea with Jane Austen recipes inspired by her novels and letters by Penn Vogler this is a cute tiny little book with recipes in it um, so here's English muffins, um, recipes inspired by her letters and her novels. And so that'll be really fun. Um, and I might just choose a few uh, recipes and try and make them. I also have the Jane Austen Handbook, Proper Life Skills from Regency England by Margaret C. Sullivan. Now this one just looked so funny because etiquette was huge in Jane Austen's time. Um, and so the back, the back says, what would Jane do? Every young lady dreams of a life spent engaging witty asides with a dashing Mr. Darcy, but how should you let him know your intentions? Seek counsel from this charming guide to Jane Austen's world. Its step-by-step -step instructions reveal the practicalities of life in Regency England, including side sensible advice on how to behave at your first ball, how to ride side saddle, how to decline an unwanted marriage proposal, how to improve your estate, how to throw a dinner party. And so this just looks really fun and I can't wait to dive into that and to get more detail about etiquette. Then this one was a really interesting find. This is Speaking of Jane Austen by Shelia K. Smith and G. B. Stern. This is a book that was published in 1944. It was not until they were both in their 20s that Sheila K. Smith and J.B. Stern became jardent, eight, jardent, <laughs> became ardent Janeites. Once introduced to her novels, they read and reread, argued, gossiped, and discussed. This book is the result. Intentionally informal, written to please its authors as well as its readers, it is a delightful excursion into a world of a past century, the world of Jane Austen's people, their characters, their motives, their ways, and their doings. Although political England of the early 19th century was fraught with confusion and conflict, the world Jane Austen knew and admired was deliciously peaceful. She had the good sense to stay within its confines and to preserve something of it that is strangely dateless and endlessly enchanting. The co-authors of Speaking of Jane Austen with their own sincere enthusiasm take their readers into this life of Georgic simplicity, of bows and bells, of everyday doings, of romance and sheer pleasure. Here we meet on familiar ground Jane Austen's hero, heroes and heroines. We see their costumes and eat their meals and read their letters. We suffer in love with Anne Elliot. We walk in the shrubbery with Fanny Price because it was less damp. <laughs> we scamper across country to Netherfield with the more athletic Elizabeth Bennet. We worry with that supreme chump, Mr. Woodhouse. We dance at a number of balls and always we are enchanted. So I'm really excited to dive into that and to see what, um, you know, uh, analysis and opinions there was of Jane Austen in 1944. I also have the Jane Austen Marriage Manual by Helen Amy. This also looks fun. How was Elizabeth Bennet expected to respond to Mr. Darcy's gauch advances? How was a mother meant to present her daughter to society for the first time? It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man, even these days, if reasonably educated, recognizes the beginning of that quotation. <laughs> That's awesome. A strict code of conduct, conduct governed a courtship and marriage in Regency England during the period in which Jane Austen's novels were set, broadly 1796 to 1816. Young genteel women had to learn and adhere to these rules. What was a girl to do? How should a mother direct her eligible daughter? Many turned to the etiquette manuals made available by a burgeoning publishing industry. 
published to coincide with the bicentenary of the death of Jane Austen. The Jane Austen Marriage Manual draws from this pool of early how-to popular literature read by Jane and her contemporaries and actually referred to in her novels, as well as Jane's own experiences. So yeah, that also sounds really interesting. This one is also a great take, um, Growing Older with Jane Austen by Maggie Lane. That Jane Austen was endearing, is endearingly popular with both a general readership and academics can admit of no doubt. But amid the wealth of approaches to her life and work, no one has made a full-length study of the concept of aging in her novels. Maggie Lane's new book sets out to fill that gap. With chapters on the loss of youth and beauty, old wives and old maids, merry widows and dowager despots, the theme allows for a lively exploration of many of Austen's most memorable characters. So this just sounds really intriguing. And then uh, to go in a completely different direction, this is The Brother Gardeners by Andrea Wolfe, Botany Empire and the Birth of an Obsession. I, I heard about this book from from the channel Hamsavini Vuchostra and uh, she's reading this for July and it just sounded intriguing so I thought I would pick it up as well. One January morning in 1734, cloth merchant Peter Collinson hurried down to the docks in London's Custom House to collect cargo just arrived from John Bartram, his new contact in the American colonies. But it was not reels of wool or bales of cotton that waited him, but plants and seeds. Over the next 40 years, Bartram would send hundreds of American species to England, where Collinson was one of a handful of men who would foster a national obsession and change the gardens of Britain forever, introducing lustrous evergreens, fiery autumn foliage, and colorful shrubs. So yeah, this just sounds, <laughs> this just sounds interest interesting. And gardens are an important part of uh, Jane Austen's work. Lots, lots happens in the gardens and the shrubberies. This is Wealth or Poverty, Jane Austen's Novels Explored by Stephen Mahoney. Again, this just seemed like an interesting, like real deep dive into a specific aspect of her books. In Jane Austen's novel, money is not simply a way of placing people. It propels plot, adds drama, and tells us about someone's personality. Taking the novels as his starting point, Stephen Mahoney looks at the wealth and social standing of Austen's characters in relation to the economic background of the day, giving us real insight into their aspirations and motives. What did a servant earn? Just how poor was Miss Bates? What were the pay and conditions of a midshipman like William Price? And how much would Elizabeth Bennet need to live comfortably if she didn't marry Darcy? So yeah, really intriguing. Now this one is totally fun. Look at this. Jane Austen cover to cover, 200 years of classic covers by Margaret C. Sullivan. So yeah, this is just like it's, they've found and they just show you the covers throughout the years of Jane Austen's books. So this will be super fun to flip through and I'll show you more of that in an upcoming video. And then last but not least, where's Jane? <laughs> totally fun, finding Jane Austen hidden in her novels, written by Rebecca Smith, illustrated by Katie Dockwell. This book has each novel and there's a synopsis of that novel and then a page or two of pictures like this where you have to find the characters <laughs> from the novel in the picture. It's like, where's Waldo, but with Jane Austen, and I love it so much. Okay, let's dive into the nonfiction. Uh, sorry, that was the nonfiction. Let's dive into the fiction. First up, I have an annotated Mansfield Park, which I'm really excited about. This is by, annotated and edited by David M. Chapard, Chapard? Um, I'm really interested in uh, reading the annotations and the notes and kind of delving into some of the themes and picking up on stuff that I, I may have missed um, as I'm reading um, Mansfield Park for Jane Austen July. So I was really excited to find that. And then I found, I've got three books by an author called Catherine Rhea. 
I'm not sure how to say her name. And I've got all three, and if I like her, I'll read the, them all, and if I don't like her, then I'll just take them back to the library, right? No harm, no foul. So I have The Austin Escape. Um, Mrs. Mary Davies finds safety in her ordered and productive life. Working as an engineer, she genuinely enjoys her job and her colleagues, particularly a certain adorable and intelligent consultant. But something is missing. When Mary's estranged childhood friend, Isabel Dyer, offers her a two-week stay in a gorgeous manor house in England, she reluctantly agrees in hopes that the holiday will shake up her quiet life in just the right ways. So that sounds fun. And then this is Dear Mr. Knightley. Um, let's see, Samantha Moore has always hidden behind the words of others, namely her favorite characters in literature. Now she will learn to write her own story by giving that story to a complete stranger. An English major of the highest order, her diet has always been Austin Dickens and Shakespeare. The problem is both her prose and conversation tend to be more Elizabeth Bennet than Sam Samantha Moore. But life for the 23-year-old orphan is about to get stranger than fiction. An anonymous Dickensian benefactor, calling himself Mr. Knightley, offers to put Sam through Northwestern University's prestigious Medal School of Journalism. There is only one catch. Sam must write frequent letters to the mysterious donor detailing her progress. Sounds interesting. So these are like vaguely connected to Jane Austen. They're not retellings really or anything like that. And then this one is Lizzie and Jane. Elizabeth left her family's home in Seattle 15 years ago to pursue her lifelong dream, chefing her own restaurant in New York City. Jane stayed behind to raise a family. Estranged since their mother's death many years ago, the circumstances of their lives are about to bring them together once again. So this sounds like a story of sisters. Um, and so yeah, interesting. The other one that I author that I got multiple books of is Deborah White Smith, and she wrote contemporary retellings of all six of the novels, and I have five of them here. Um, there's one still waiting, still waiting to come. Okay, so we have Reason and Romance, a contemporary retelling of Sense and Sensibility, and the author is Deborah White Smith. These covers are just really fun. So Reason and Romance is the retelling of Sense and Sensibility. And then First Impressions is the contemporary retelling of Pride and Prejudice, um, which is interesting because isn't First Impressions what she called Sense and Sensibility originally? Or am I getting that wrong? Anyway, another fun cover. And then Possibilities, a contemporary retelling of Persuasion. So yeah, these covers are just super cute and it's too bad that I could not get the other two in the same, in the same fun covers. The other two um, I could only get as large print editions. So I only have four actually so far. The other two I'm still waiting to come in from the library. And this last one um, I got, it was a large print and this is Amanda, um, the contemporary retelling of Emma. Okay, so let's dive into some others that I have here where I don't have multiples of them. I have Jane in Love by Rachel Givney. I heard of this book from, I think Krista, from Books and Jams. And what attracted me to this one is there's a time travel element, Bath, England, 1803. At 28, Jane Austen prefers walking and reading to balls. She also dreams of someday publishing her carefully crafted stories. Above all, she wants love. In grave danger of becoming a spinster, Jane goes searching for a radical solution and by accident, time travels. She lands in Bath, England, present day, the film set of Northanger Abbey. As Jane acquaints herself with the horseless carriages and shocking fashions of the 21st century, she also discovers she's now a published author, a famous one. She befriends Sophia Wentworth, a fading Hollywood actress starring in the new period film. She offers to help Jane return to her own time. Then Jane meets Fred, Sophia's brother, who has the audacity to be handsome, clever, and kind-hearted. 
but when Jane starts falling in love with Fred, disaster strikes. All her books begin disappearing from the shelves. Jane realizes that the longer she remains in the 21st century, the more she will erase herself from history. Jane must decide, is a chance at love worth staying lost in time? So I find the time travel aspect um, intriguing. And this is my Jane Austen Summer, A Season in Mansfield Park by Cindy Jones. So, so I was uh, particularly attracted to retellings or adaptations of Mansfield Park, since that's the one I'm reading this year for Jane Austen July. Lily has squeezed herself into undersized relationships all her life, hoping one might grow as large as those found in the Jane Austen novels she loves. But lately, her world is running out of places for her to fit. So when her bookish friend invites her to spend the summer at a Jane Austen literary festival in England, she jumps at the chance to reinvent herself. There, among the rich, promising world of Mansfield Park reenactments, Lily finds people whose longing to live in a, in a novel equals her own. But real life problems have a way of following you wherever you go, and Lily's accompany her to England. Unless she can change her ways, she could face the fate of so many of Miss Austen's characters, destined to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So there you go. Interesting. Now, <laughs> We're getting more and more interesting as we go here. This is First Impressions by Charles Lovett, a novel of old books, unexpected love, and Jane Austen. Could Jane Austen have stolen the plot of Pride and Prejudice? <gasps> that is exactly the question devoted Janeite Sophie Collingwood must answer in this beguiling, brilliantly imagined literary adventure by uh, Charles Lovett. In a small Hampshire village at the end of the 18th century, a young Jane Austen strikes up an unexpected friendship with an elderly clergyman named Richard Mansfield. Consumed with writing her first novel, Jane finds in Mr. Mansfield, an author himself, a perceptive reader of her work and a pleasant companion for long walks through the green fields and narrow lanes near Steventon. In present-day London, recent Oxford graduate Sophie Collingwood has just taken a job at an antiquarian bookshop when two different customers call on the same day seeking the very same rare 18th century volume, a second edition of A Little Book of Allegories by Richard Mansfield. Their queries draw Sophie into a mystery that will cast doubt on the true authorship of Pride and Prejudice and ultimately threaten her life. Woo, that sounds good. I also picked up Unmarriageable by Sonia Kamal. This is Pride and Prejudice in Pakistan. So yeah, I'm intrigued by that. And the one thing I'm not entirely sure of is if it's modern day or, or not. I think it might be modern day. But yeah, uh, that sounds great too. And then I also have Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors by Sonali Dev. This is um, let's see. It is a truth universally acknowledged that only in an overachieving Indian American family can a genius daughter be considered a black sheep. Dr. Trisha Raj is, new, is San Francisco's most acclaimed neurosurgeon, but that's not enough for the Rajas. Rages? I'm sorry, I'm not going to say that right her influential immigrant family who have achieved power by making their own non-negotiable rules. Never trust an outsider, never do anything to jeopardize your brother's political aspirations, and never ever defy your family. Trisha is guilty of breaking all three rules, but now she has the chance to redeem herself so long as she doesn't repeat her old mistakes. Two more. The Mysterious Death of Jane Austen by Lindsay Ashford. 26 years have passed since the death of Jane Austen. Armed with a lock of Austen's hair as perhaps her best clue, Anne Sharp, former governess to the Austen family, and Jane's close friend has decided to tell her last story. At last, to tell her story. A story of family intrigues, shocking secrets, forbidden loves, and maybe even murder. Upon its publication in the UK, Lindsay Ashford's fictional interpretation of the few facts surrounding Jane Austen's mysterious death sparked an international debate and uproar. None of the medical theories offers a satisfactory explanation for Jane Austen's early demise at the age of 41. Could it be that what everyone had assumed was a death by natural causes was actually more sinister? <laughs> 
and Murder at Mansfield Park by Lynn Shepard. <laughs> These books are, have been getting increasingly more fantastical, but hey, in this ingenious new twist on Mansfield Park, the famously meek Fanny Price, whom Jane Austen's own mother called insipid, has been transformed into a rich heiress who is spoiled, condescending, and generally hated throughout the county. Mary Crawford, on the other hand, is as good as Fanny is bad, and suffers great indignities at the hands of her vindictive neighbor. It's only after Fanny is brutally killed on the grounds of Mansfield Park that Mary comes into her own, teaming up with a thief taker from London to solve Fanny's murder. <laughs> wow, right? So there you have it. That is my Jane Austen inspired library haul. What do you think? Have you read any of these books? I would love to chat with you about them in the comment section down below. Do any of these books sound intriguing to you? Let's chat about that as well. And I will see you for another video soon. Bye.